أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على 
الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى وأرسله رحمة للعالمين أرسله هدى وبدين الحق فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى تابعيه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين نحمد الله بخير ما حمده الحامدون الحمد لله حمد الذاكرين الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد حبيب رب العالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وتابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين The most basic statement that all Muslims are aware of and are supposed to internalize. They repeat in their adhan, they repeat in their prayers, they repeat quite often seamlessly and even perhaps without much thought or awareness consisting of two simple words Allahu Akbar God is greatest but within these two words within the simple mantra is an entire philosophy Because if you accept that God is greatest, if you say not simply that God is great, but God is greatest, you are not saying that Allahu Kabir, you're not saying that God is great, but you are saying Allahu Akbar, God is greatest then that, of course, implies a relationship 
greatest in relation to what and to whom. And it is basic and elementary in Islamic theology and Islamic belief that God is greatest than everything. God is greatest than any other possible commitment, loyalty, emotion, feeling, philosophy that one may hold. When you say God is greatest, you are also saying God is greater than myself. The implication is that I am not servile to myself. My first commitment of loyalty and gratitude is not to myself and not even to my family and not even to anything else, but it is simply to God. That is why in its very core, When you ask what is Islam in a fundamental and inherent and basic way about, and the thing that emerges at you from so much of the seerah of the Prophet, والسلام, but so much of the Quran page after page, surah after surah, is that Islam came to teach people, to educate people on a way of life in which servitude is not owed to the self or to other human beings but to God and to God alone. That is why the earliest Muslims, when they described their faith to the Abyssinian king, they said our religion came to liberate us from servitude to fellow human beings to liberate us from servitude to fellow human beings, to servitude only to God. It is remarkable, but when servitude is not even owed to the self, but owed to your maker, a maker who benefits nothing from all your worship. A maker who educates you for your own good. When servitude is owed to this maker, not even owed to the self. And it's not owed to others. It does have a remarkable liberating impact on the soul of a determined human being. If we are honest with ourselves, if we are honest with ourselves, if we do not feel liberated by Islam, if Islam doesn't liberate us from a servile, infantile relationship with our physical bodies 
or a servile infantile relationship to our whims and desire. Or if Islam doesn't liberate us from a servile infantile relationship to our moods and whims or to material possessions or to wealth or to tribal affiliations and nationalisms. We are not real Muslims if we are being truly honest with ourselves. If we can say Allahu Akbar repeatedly, but when all is said and done, it is our own whim that is truly the dominant factor in our life. If it's truly our own mood that is truly the dominant factor in our life. Or if it is what we covet that is the dominant factor for our life. So many of us, it is our fears and our anxieties that are the dominant factors in our life. It is actually what we fear and what we are anxious about. If any of these things or all of these things loom larger than the proclamation, Allahu Akbar, God is greatest, then we have not begun to understand the sweetness of being liberated by faith. Liberation by Iman, to be liberated by Iman, is to understand quintessentially what the message of the Prophet ﷺ was about. And inherent within the very basic idea that God is greatest is the rejection of all forms of oppression and servitude, whether it is to the self or to others. And that is precisely why it is an oxymoron, a complete contradiction in terms for a Muslim to accept or reconcile one with despotism and autocracy and injustice. because it makes a mockery out of the entire message of the Prophet and the entire message of Allahu Akbar. If a human being, including yourself, can be the greatest or is the greatest in a determination of how you go about making decisions. So in in other words, put it bluntly, if it is a human being that you fear the most or a human being that you covet pleasing the most or a human being that influences you the most, then what remains of Allahu Akbar? Even if that human being is yourself, Islam is a radical message of liberation. Truly a radical message of liberation. 
One of the most dangerous things that happens with demanding and lofty systems of belief is that these systems can be co-opted by those who have no desire to live up to its ideals but have every desire to philosophize these ideals to bring them down to their level. So Allahu Akbar poses a challenge to every Muslim. You can either say, I refuse to live subservient to my whims and desires. I can refuse to live subservient to my moods. I refuse to be subservient to blind loyalties and irrational convictions and understand that this is a struggle, this is a jihad. And you embark upon this jihad understanding fully well that you can never be satisfied that you have in fact succeeded but you simply constantly are in a state of supplication to God to accept your effort for what it is. Or you can do what a lot of people do. And that is to say, I accept the principle of Allahu Akbar, but then philosophize it to empty it of all meaning and content. So many Muslims, as happens, by the way, with all lofty ideas and lofty ideals, will say, sure, Allahu Akbar, that's true, but find enough in the dense technicalities of text to distract themselves from the ethical and moral revolutionary meaning of the message of Allahu Akbar. So Allahu Akbar doesn't become about liberation, it becomes about performance, technically correct performance. Or Allahu Akbar doesn't become about self-liberation and the liberation of others, but becomes about the pietistic affectations of culture, wearing the right robe, the right hat, the right beard. Allahu Akbar doesn't become about ethical aspirations, but about avoidance of fitna. And that fitna ashaddu min al-qatl. Fitna is worse than murder. And that in order to avoid fitna, we have to accept despotism. In other words, you embrace the ideal, but you ultimately betray the ideal because of a weakness inside of yourself. The first thing we learn about the Prophet and his companions is that once they believed in something, they struggled to mold their life according to their conviction. They struggled to mold their life according to their conviction. So many stories, such and such companion gave up all their money to take care of the needy, 
such and such companion gave everything they own to take care, uh, to help the Muslim army. Such and such companion would spend all the night prayer. We, in fact, among the most elementary things we learn is that conviction changed the mood and attitude of, of the Muslim character. Muslims who were known to be excitable and to easily lose their temper upon coming Muslim, they would rebel against their temper. Muslims who were known to have a sarcastic, mocking personality, upon becoming Muslim, they would wage war with the weaknesses in their personality. Muslims who, were, who had a character defect of being timid and cowardly would wage war against their own timidity and lack of courage. In other words, the very nature of Allahu Akbar is that you are committed to change and to principle. But so many of today's Muslims, but before actually I get that, we in fact learn that the idea of a Muslim that becomes Muslim but yet continue on like a fallen leaf from a tree branch being blown by the wind every other direction is completely antithetical to everything that we learn from the seer. As the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تكن إما. An imma is a person that blows whichever way. Live by principle. It is not consistent with the Muslim to wake up in a bad mood so they are in a bad mood. Then they're in a better mood by noon because maybe they had their coffee. Then they're back in a bad mood by the end of day because maybe they finished work and they're tired. Then maybe they're in a better mood because they just finished a comedy show. Then they're in a bad mood because they're thinking of tomorrow's work. That's not a Muslim. That's an imma. That's a person who just keep blowing with the wind. Then Islam has not taught you Allahu Akbar. And Allahu Akbar starts with Akbar than you, greater than you. Dominance over the self, control over the self, subjugation of the self. Today's Muslims so often take Islam While they repeat Allahu Akbar a gazillion times, but they empty these two words of all moral and ethical and philosophical content. That one is left wondering in what sense is God greater or the greatest or greater than anything else in your life. ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وطبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين
when you learn the ethical, moral, and philosophical principle of Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Like all ethical principles, they are indivisible. You cannot segment them. You either understand that as a tenet and a basic cornerstone of your existence, or the idea itself seeks to have coherence in your life. You find so many American Muslims approaching the issue of Islam as if they can understand God is the greatest in relation to what happens to their local mosque, perhaps what happens to the Islamic conferences or the Islamic uh, cultural events they attend, whether it's an Isna conference or an Ikna conference or whatnot. But they think that they can live oblivious to what takes place in the rest of the world. So many So many Muslims think, for instance, that what transpires with Islam in the heart of Mecca and Medina, or in the heart of Jerusalem, or indeed in the heart of Europe, or in, among, in China, or in India, somehow doesn't affect their commitment to Allahu Akbar. But morals cannot be segmented and broken down in that way. In the same way that either you believe that human beings have a right as human beings, or you don't. You cannot be that some human beings have rights if they are in the right place and time while others can be ignored. Our world and in fact the world of ethics and morality are always interlinked. Recently, as recent as last week, the Association of Muslim Scholars for out of Saudi Arabia issued what I consider to be a very alarming proclamation. That proclamation was repeated in all the podiums of Saudi Arabia all over the country, including Mecca and Medina, the podiums of the Prophet ﷺ. In this proclamation, the Association of Muslim Scholars declared that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization, that they are contrary to the true Islam, that they are but a seditious political party that is against the principles of the pure Islam, that they are a terrorist group that causes fitna and violence. 
This is the Muslim Brotherhood, the organization known as the Ikhwan. In Mecca and Medina, the podium of the Prophet, the podiums of the Prophet والسلام, the Khatibs got up there and gave an entire sermon about how the evils of the Muslim Brotherhood and how anyone that belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist and that this organization is a terrorist organization, etc., etc. To be quite honest with you, I've never, I have my own principal disagreements with the philosophical package of the Muslim Brotherhood. But that's near, neither here nor there right now. The object of the proclamation, we Muslim Brotherhood is among the Islamic movements that has eschewed violence, rejected violence a very long time ago. And in fact, they are often accused of being too pacifist. Israel believes that Hamas is Muslim Brotherhood, but that's a separate question because whether they are or not, because Hamas is confronting an unlawful occupation, which is very different than the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunis or the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or indeed the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. What was very interesting is that after the Association of Muslim Scholars issued this proclamation and after the sermons in Mecca and Medina and all over Saudi Arabia informing the Muslim world that if you not just belong to the Muslim Brotherhood, but if you sympathize with the Muslim Brotherhood, then you are a terrorist. Israel, all over its media, had endless praise for Saudi clerics and Saudi jurists. These are the same Saudi clerics who know just but a few years ago used to represent Wahhabi Islam, the, 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 the embodiment of intolerance. According to several Israeli newspapers and TV shows, they applauded Saudi, the Saudi scholars for condemning terrorism and for condemning an evil organization and so on and so forth. I'll tell you that the purpose of this the entire performance, utilizing the pulpit of the Prophet والسلام, is not the Muslim Brotherhood. Because today, if you dissent against any autocratic government, whether you are dissenting against the autocratic government in Egypt, or whether you are dissenting against the autocratic government of Saudi Arabia, or opposing the government in Yemen, or opposing Haftar's government in Libya, or opposing the Emirat, or in fact opposing the communist Chinese government in China, or opposing the Hindu government in India, the ready-made accusation against you is that you, you are Ikhwan, you are Muslim Brotherhood. Even more than that, the funny thing is that you could be even not Muslim at all, and still be accused of being Ikhwan. You could be someone who doesn't pray, who is an alcoholic, who fools around all the time in inappropriate and promiscuous activity. And if you oppose governments, autocratic governments, 
you'll still be called a Kohen. In a word, the purpose, what the Saudi jurists were condemning from the podium of the Prophet was not the Ikhwan as an organization, but if it is phenomena which now they have become accustomed or used to calling political Islam. From Mecca and Medina, we were informed by the Saudi Imams and the Imams in the Emirat, because the same sermon was also given in Emirat, the same sermon was given in Egypt, that political Islam is dangerous, political Islam is evil. If you believe in political Islam, then you have no rights as a human being and you will be treated as a terrorist. You might say, well, you know, this is happening in faraway lands. What does this have to do with us? I told you, ethics and principles are indivisible. So consider this. First, why is it that Israel, that the Emirat and Saudi Arabia and the Bahrain and these autocratic kingdoms, oil kingdoms, are so keen on a chummy, warm relationship with Israel? Is it to confront the Iranian danger as they often claim? In a very good article published by the political scientist Nader Hashmi called The Kimara of Peace Between Israel and the Arab World, a Critique of the Abraham Accords, Nader Hashmi very convincingly demonstrates that in fact it is not about confronting the Iranian threat, but it is because these Arab oil kingdoms are convinced that a close relationship with Israel against what they term political Islam can help them fight off democratization movements in the Middle East. That Israel, in fact, has accepted, has allowed itself now to play the role of ref the, the, the refuge of dictators that after the Khashoggi event, people like Mohammed bin Salman became convinced after Netanyahu bragged and Trump bragged that Netanyahu especially bragged that it was Israeli influence that protected Mohammed bin Salman from having to pay the consequences of assassinating, for assassinating Khashoggi. Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed became convinced that Israel can protect them from their own people that Israel can help protect them from democracy and human rights. That as long as they are allied with Israel, then Israel can use its good offices in the West so that they can jail and torture and maim and, and do every horrendous thing and not have to pay the cost. And why the Ikhwan? Because in their thinking, symbolically, Ikhwan is the only successful, democratically oriented, grassroots organization in the Middle East. So if there is an Islamic democracy 
if there's any hope for an Islamic democracy, the only open venue for it is that that comes through the Ikhwan. And they want to close the door on that. But the real venue is not just the Ikhwan, it's political Islam itself. What they call political Islam. So let's leave Saudi Arabia for a second and go to France. France has given us a whole bunch of proposed laws that again feature political Islam. According to these new laws, there is a charter that has been given to the Association of Muslim Imams in France. They either agree to this charter or they will have their Islamic center closed down and the Imam who doesn't comply with the charter will be fired if not worse, they might be imprisoned, and if they're not a French citizen, they'll be deported. So according to this charter and the new laws, no more homeschooling for Muslims, and if you're a Muslim parent that fails to send your child to a public school, you could go to prison for six months or more. If you're a Muslim parent and you object that a teacher, for instance, in your school, in the, in the school is teaching something that you find offensive. Not just the cartoons, not just the pornographic cartoons, but according to the way this law is drafted, it's so broad and so loose that even if you go and you complain that the prophet, for instance, is portrayed as bloody or is portrayed as a tyrant or that according to the way that Islam is taught in your school, that Islam spread by the sword, if you're not a, a French citizen, you can be deported. And if you're a French citizen, you can be charged for intimidating public officials on religious grounds. All Muslim children will be given ID identification numbers that will be used to ensure that they are attending school. Parents who break the law would face up to six months in prison and fines. If you, you're a Muslim and you share any information, like for instance, you, try, you want to coordinate with fellow Muslim parents because you don't like the way Islam is being taught in your school. So you share information with other Muslim parents about the following teacher or the following superintendent or the following school official. You are prosecuted under terrorism laws and you could go to prison. Imams can only be appointed with permission of the French government and only after being certified as having correct Islamic belief. And they can be fired from their position by the French government at any time. Now, France says we're not fighting Islam. None of this is against Islam. We're only fighting political Islam. This is all directed against political Islam. Why? Because in France, we respect free speech. And these Islamists, they don't understand free speech. In fact, they hate free speech. At the same time that this law 
that is supposed to protect French values, free speech values, by making sure bad Muslims do not get to censor what is being taught about their religion, France is proposing one of the strangest laws to be proposed in a democracy. A law which will go into effect that makes it a crime if you film or take a picture of a French cop beating a civilian. If a French, if there is a demonstration, let's say a demonstration by Muslims, or let's say the French police go storm a mosque and they start beating some Muslims, and let's say you take a picture of the beating or you film them on your phone and you post it, you're committed a crime and you go to prison. So disseminating information on police brutality is a crime, and that's not against free speech. But asking France not to publish pornographic images of the Prophet, now that's against free speech. Ignorance is what allows so many people to be moronic and idiotic. So many people that I've heard say, well, you know, you've got to understand France has a different way of understanding religion and its principles of free speech. You, you just don't know enough. You don't just don't know enough about the laws in France because you don't bother studying and doing your homework. A law... At the same time, a law that would protect French police if they brutalize Muslims, or anyone in fact, by making it a crime to film them or post information about them. At the same time, we Muslims are lectured about how they don't understand French values. And because they don't understand French values, we have to make sure that either you give the right sermons that reflect French values or we get to shut you up because Islam as a religion is suspect. We don't exercise this type of hegemonic supervision over Judaism. We don't monitor Christian churches. We don't monitor synagogues. We don't monitor Hindu temples. We monitor you, Muslims, only Muslims. But let's come to this point about is political Islam. Because according to friend, these new French laws, if you are an imam and you do not condemn political Islam, you lose your job. And it is illegal now in France to believe in political Islam. Exactly what the imams of Saudi Arabia said. And exactly what Israel praised about what the imams of Saudi Arabia said. But let me ask you this. If an imam in Saudi Arabia st stands in the podium of the prophet and praises peace with Israel, or stands in the midst of a mosque in Paris and praises peace with Israel, is that political Islam? Because according to the French and the Saudis, no, it's not. What if the, an imam stands in Paris or in Mecca and praises the king of Saudi Arabia? Is that political Islam? According to both places, no, it's not. What if you stand in the midst of either Paris or Mecca and say, it is haram to boycott French products. 
is that political Islam? According to most places, no, it's not. Because in fact, the Imam in Mecca stood up at the podium of the Prophet and said, you cannot boycott French products. But what if you do the opposite? What if you stand in Paris and say, boycott French products? Or stand in Mecca or Medina and say, boycott French products? Now it's political Islam. What if you stand in both places and say, king of Saudi Arabia, bad, not good? Now it's political Islam. What if you stand in both places and say, peace with Israel, bad, not good? Now it's political Islam. What if you stand in both places and say, we have to always be mindful of the painful memory of the Holocaust? Is that political Islam? Both places will say, no, it's not political Islam. It's good Islam. What if you stand in both places and say, we have to be mindful of the Nakba? When Palestine was destroyed and the genocide committed against Palestinians, now it's political Islam and that's bad. What if you stand as an imam in Paris and say, I want to give a khutbah about the history of colonial France and the way France killed millions of Algerians and massacred millions of Muslims in Chad and Mali and Senegal. Uh-uh, that's political Islam. You lose your job. What if then you want to give a khutbah to say, you know, France colonial history is not that bad. They didn't really do that much harm. They went to civilized people. Now that's not political Islam. That would be good Islam. What if you wanted to give a khutbah to say Muslims in France are not given equal opportunity, equal opportunity rights in the job market, or they're not paid equal wages? In other words, you're complaining about their rights as laborers. That would be political Islam. And you would be promptly be fired as an imam. What if you stood in a khutbah and wanted to give a khutbah in France about the history of racism in France against Muslims? That would be political Islam. Bad. What if you wanted to give the khutbah about the history of racism in France against Jews? That would not be political Islam. Good. What if you wanted to give a khutbah about dictatorship and how the Muslim world needs democracy? That would be political Islam. But what if you give khutbah about how French business is good for the Muslim world. That would not be political Islam. What if as a khatib, you get up there and you want to warn your fellow Muslims about the miserable human trafficking business in France, which by the way, eats up the sons of Christians, Jews, and Muslims and atheists in a pornography industry with equal measure. It doesn't discriminate. Would that be political Islam or would that not be political Islam? For all these great French theorists and French legal minds, go back to Allahu Akbar. Think of Allahu Akbar. Think of all the mess I just outlined that crosses the borders and the seas from Mecca to Medina to Paris. All that mess, Ikhwan, political Islam, etc., etc., and compare it to Allahu Akbar. The word of the truth the pristineness of the truth. 
the purity of the truth. This is the way you can tell the difference between darkness and light. Between beauty and ugliness. اللهم اعفو عنا اللهم اغفر لنا اللهم ارحمنا اللهم توب علينا يا تواب يا رب العالمين الله forgive our sins grant us guidance and light direct us towards the truthful path يا رب العالمين and grant us your favor and support and trust and blessings صلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ان الله يقول المحلي والحسن والعيد والعيد كله وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم واقيموا الصلاه